All right. Um, as promised, uh, I found, it actually took a while to find, my uh, uh, selection of science related comics. Um, this has been collected for many years, and yeah, some of them are a little bit dated, uh, so I try to skip over the ones that are dated. I have to go through it and probably clean it out just a tiny bit. So, in any case, um, yes, the, if you, I will endeavor to just let this thing run on a slideshow uh, before class, just because I haven't done it uh, at, at much at all during during the term. But for right now, I do need to flip over to the course material, and we will get to that in just a few seconds. A couple things that I need to discuss uh, in terms of timing. Um, so we're finished the organic uh, class material. You have a worksheet that is due next Tuesday because this weekend is a long weekend and Monday is a holiday. So it is due midnight Tuesday to your TAs. The TAs, the, okay, back up. I've been having some problems with my email um, over the past two weeks apparently. Uh, and so uh, if you sent me an email in the last week or so, I probably only got it yesterday. Uh, I got 30 emails put into my inbox and they were backdated by about four or five days. So I apologize if I wasn't responding in a reasonable time. I literally just got your email yesterday and I've been responding to people's emails um, since that point in time. Um, with regards to that, also the TAs, I sent the TAs the answer key for the worksheet that you're working on. Just because the TAs often don't have a good organic background, uh, we, were, we actually spent quite a bit of time uh, during our TA meeting going through organic nomenclature. So please bear with the TAs. For many of them, this is new to them as well. Uh, and so you're working together through it. Um, I thought I sent them the answer key on the weekend. And apparently I didn't when I got an email yesterday saying, is there a key coming around? And so I resent it. So uh, that's just an issue with my email server not sending emails when it tells me that it has, and I uh, have sent in a trouble ticket on that. So that's way more information that you needed to know other than I apologize for the delay in responding to emails. I literally just got a whole bunch yesterday. Um, this weekend is the Easter long weekend, so we actually aren't coming uh, together again until next Wednesday. Uh, you have that organic worksheet that is due Tuesday um, at midnight to your TA, or to me if you're not taking Chem 121. I believe I sent around to everybody the schedule for the presentations. And, you know, just a couple people want to confirm that they actually received that email. That would be great. Um, I did send them all yesterday, late last night, like midnight. Um, and so you have the final presentation schedule. And you also have, good, thank you, um, the marking rubric. So I'm actually trying to use technology um, in an advanced or reasonable way. Um, that being said, that Excel worksheet actually is pre-populated with the presentations for your section uh, as one, and it is filled out in Excel. So I didn't give the names. If the student wishes to give their name when they give their presentation, that's fine, then you can type it in but I've given the presentation title in the order in which the presentations are gonna go, and you literally have to do, just put something in for the grade that they are gonna be given, and Excel does all the rest of the work. So it needs to be filled out electronically. At the bottom of each one, it'll be the grade that has, it, it automatically adds up the numbers uh, once you've completed it, and you go from there. Um, that Excel spreadsheet, play around with it just a little bit till you get an idea. It is locked in the sense that there's cells you can't touch. There's only ce certain cells that you can actually input stuff into. Um, but you should be able to resave it and then email it to your TA when all of the presentations are done. Uh, where was I going to get that? Oh, yes. And I realized after I sent that um, the, the, the final presentation schedule that two people had contacted me 
with regards to switching. Like a lot of people I have switched because that was no problem. I, everyone I was able to accommodate. Two people weren't sure when they were gonna be available. One of them had just started a new job and they knew that they were gonna be working on the day of their normal lab schedule, so they wanted to switch and I said, sure, not a problem. Let me know when you have your schedule for the next two weeks. So if you are one of those people, send me an email and I will still move you into a comfortable section, a section that works for you. Um, that's not a problem. I want to accommodate you as best as, as, as I possibly can for, for, you know, I don't want to take away your time from work, that type of idea. So that's what I wanted to put out with regards to that. Does anyone have any questions on the organic worksheet or the upcoming presentation? Do the presentation start at nine or eight? Um, I, the numbers are in there. Um, we're gonna follow the schedule I sent out. If I said they were gonna start at nine, we'll start at nine. I don't remember what I put in the things. So every one of them has a time for starting and that's what we're gonna follow. When do we have to submit what PDF? Rufaro? You don't. You don't have to submit a PDF. The only thing that you are being graded on is your presentation. Um, if I want a copy of your presentation, I will ask you for it. Uh, and generally the reason I'm asking you for a copy of your presentation is because I found it probably interesting and I may want to incorporate some of that into my course material. Um, that's how I get some of the examples that I've done in this class comes from what a student has presented in the past. Uh, we don't do gases here. But when, uh, I, if I were teaching Chem 100, one of my examples was a question on diving gases and you know uh, the toxicity of oxygen and nitrogen in the body. That came from a student presentation. And I'm like, that's cool, we're doing that in class. So, yes. So I learn from a lot of the presentations as well. It's, it's, I find it uh, very illuminating for me to see what areas of science, uh, what areas of the world uh, chemistry is applicable in. So um, there was some concern or I don't know, just a little bit of a annoyance, a little bit about marking. Your grading of each other does matter. It is taken into account. So um, I'm grading presentations, the TAs are grading presentations, and all of the students are grading each other's presentations and all of that actually does factor into the final grade. I will give the background on why there are certain rules uh, and those rules are delineated in the presentation document from the beginning, given out at the beginning of the term. Students, you, find it very uncomfortable grading your peers. Most of you do anyway. That's, that's just because you're not comfortable doing it, you haven't done it before. Some of you have probably worked or been put into a, a management authoritative uh, th authority role, either uh, you know on sports teams or whatever you're working in. You might have had an employment where you became a manager or the manager for the day or whatever the case is. Um, if you uh, have been advancing in hockey or dance or martial arts, you're teaching other people, and so you're evaluating them as well. Not everybody is comfortable doing that, and it's sometimes difficult. So when I first started doing presentations, I asked students to evaluate each other and some students just gave everybody a five all the way down. Well, that's not fair. It doesn't improve your ability to evaluate, to critically assess and evaluate. Um, you apply that to the articles you look at. You look at an article and go, is this thing have any bias and the like? Well, you can assess each other as well. And it's not a negative at all. Some people are gonna put a lot of time and energy and effort into it and give a great presentation. Others, not so much. I, I'm, it, that's just reality. Um, so I said, you know, the grades have to average between 60 and 80% or 70 and 80%. And then all of a sudden everyone started, or not everyone, some students started giving me a run four, 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 which is exactly 80%. And again, shirking the, that aspect of the presentation, which is getting comfortable assessing other people. In your future careers, you're gonna be doing that. Um, you're gonna be assessing the quality of someone's work. Uh, if you're an engineer, that's basically what you, you, you 
give a responsibility and you go back and you make assessments on it. So here is a relatively safe environment in which to do that. And to address this, giving everybody four, I said there needs to be a distribution. You need to give, you know, some people can get 100%, that's fine. Some people can get 40%, that's fine. The average needs to be between 60 and 80 and there needs to be a reasonable standard deviation on the distribution. Now, associated with that, um, how do I want to put this? Everyone, the, the, the grades are going to be, like if your averages are really low, someone averages are really high, it's all going to work out. So um, just try to be consistent through the grading of everyone's presentation. And uh, myself will appropriately scale things such that we get a reasonable distribution. So that is, that is my job, is to make sure that everything's fair for everybody. And Kyla's uh, question is, do we have to watch everyone's presentation? You have to watch everyone's presentation in your section over two weeks. So if you are in section L1, you are going to be there for two weeks for the duration of the 16 or 17 presentations that are in, in section L1. You are totally encouraged to come to other sections and watch other presentations if you find something interesting. You're going through that document and you see something, hey, that looks kind of cool. <coughs> you're free to attend. Um, unfortunately, you can't invite outside people to come and w watch, but if you want to have a copy of your presentation, we can, like this class is recorded, we can record your presentation, you can download it, and then we can delete it. Are there other questions? All right, looks like everyone's either completely confused or comfortable with what I've just said. Um, we are going to get back into thermodynamics starting right about now. So the last time we looked at thermodynamics was, yeah, over a week ago now, excuse me. And we finished off uh, on the next slide from this one. But what I want to start with is the revisiting of what Gibbs free energy is. We didn't derive the equations, I were given to you, but we are I'm in, in conveying that Gibbs free energy is proportional to the entropy of the universe and it is our spontaneity predictor. So if we can calculate delta G, and the equation for calculating delta G is presented right there, delta H minus T delta S of the system, um, then we can have an idea on whether the presentation, or sorry, whether the, presentation, whether the uh, reaction is spontaneous or not. The Gibbs free energy is the maximum work that can be extracted from a system and still have a spontaneous process. And by the way we've defined it, this is at constant temperature and pressure. That is pretty much the world around you, okay? The world exists under reasonably constant pressure conditions. Uh, in a laboratory, the pressure isn't changing much. Um, if you're an engineer, you might actually be working under constant volume conditions. If you're working under constant volume, there is an analogous free energy for constant volume conditions as well to figure out in your reactor vessel, is it gonna, the reaction that you want to happen, is it actually gonna happen, is it spontaneous? We're going to focus on constant pressure, which is the Gibbs free energy. And so if delta G is less than zero, we have a spontaneous reaction, and we would call that reaction exergonic. If delta G is greater than zero, we have a non-spontaneous process, and that reaction is endergonic. And the last one is if delta G is equal to zero, we have a system that is at equilibrium. And so we <coughs> want to spend a little bit of time looking at delta G as a function of temperature. Uh, we have a linear relationship here. Delta G is delta H minus T delta S. So if we were to plot delta G versus temperature for various different values of delta H and delta S, we have 
some possibilities here. And that's exactly what we are going to do. Now, this morning's class had problems with it being glitchy. I'm, if it is, let me know, uh, and I can ad uh, try to adapt to that, but it seems to be an on-the-fly ad adapting. So just let me know if there becomes a problem. So the best way to graph this is to have a straight line to start with. And so we have free energy. versus temperature. And because we're working in temperature, the lowest temperature we can get is zero Kelvin, which is why I've presented the graph this way. What we are plotting is delta G is delta H minus T delta S. And so there's four possible scenarios here. And so the first one has delta H being positive and delta S being positive. So if we look at this a little bit closer, at T equals zero, delta G is delta H. So if delta it becomes positive, that's our starting point right there. And I need to ask you, if delta S is positive, is my slope going to go up or is my slope going to go down? Which way does my slope go if delta S is positive? Benjamin says up. Do other people agree? Mark agrees. Christian does not. And now I wish we had the boxing ring. What you might have not have seen or just neglected is the negative in front. Yes. So in proper notation, just wanted to go back and see. Yes. So let's just go back to this. And if we look over here, the way that this is presented, delta G B is first, the intercept is B, and there is a negative sign in front of the slope. So there we go. So it actually goes down. Let me get a next line, eh? So what we have is something that goes like that. I want to put slightly less slope on that. And so this would be positive with positive. I'm just going to redraw that one more time. Just because oh, that worked really well. Sorry about that. And so here it is positive with positive. The reason why I redrew it is because remember that I just wanted to put something over on this side that when delta G is negative, we have a spontaneous process. When delta G is not negative, this is not spontaneous. So in this first example as presented here, this one is going to be spontaneous at high temperatures. Okay. We're going to keep positive delta H and now go with a negative delta S. What that's going to do is flip the slope. Yep, that's going to flip the slope. And so we're going to start off here. And now we have a line that goes in an upward direction like that. Sorry, it's cutting through my title. It's just the way it's going to be. That is positive with negative. And this one, when is this one spontaneous?
When is this one spontaneous? Never. That's correct. This is never spontaneous. That reaction is never spontaneous. Good. Um, the next option is to take a negative delta H with a positive delta S. So we're starting off somewhere below zero. And if it is a positive delta S, this is going to have a downward slope like this. When is this one spontaneous? This one is, yeah, always spontaneous. And the final one goes up like that, and that would be a negative with negative. And this one would be spontaneous at low temperatures. Good. Good feedback. Thank you for answering my questions. <clears throat> the other thing that I want to put on this graph is just to realize what the value of delta G is. Now that we've plotted this, we've got values. We've got a value right there. We've got a value right there at two different temperatures. Depending on the line, this is the amount of work or the maximum amount of work that can be extracted. That is the maximum amount of work that can be extracted and still have a spontaneous process. And for every graph, it's the value of delta G. On the other hand, we've got things like this and that. Okay, that's the minimum work we need to put in to make spontaneous. That is the minimum amount of work that you need to put in to make the process spontaneous. And this figure just is exactly the same thing. Just emphasize that if I get a computer to draw it, it gives us back what we've got. Okay, We have the maximum work that the system is capable of doing and still be spontaneous. The minimum work that must be done to make it spontaneous uh, are the two values of the red arrows there. If I go back to this, we have those four possible scenarios. Delta H is positive, 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 negative, etc. I'm not asking you to memorize it. That's not how I would hope you get this. I would hope that you just sit there and can be able to rationalize that very quickly. On here, it would not, doesn't take that long to create a graph that looks like this. And if we have delta H equals positive, delta S equals negative, then we can sit here and go, if delta H is positive, it goes right there. Negative means it's got an upward slope. And so we're going to say this is never spontaneous. So literally by creating a graph on the fly, you're able to figure out when a reaction is going to be spontaneous. And so we did that. Does anyone have any questions on that course on this? So about the temperature dependence, we literally just plotted this um, and we can see here that the Gibbs free energy is dependent on temperature, right? As the temperature changes, it is explicitly in the equation for delta G. But what about the enthalpy and the entropy? So the reaction enthalpy, which is delta H, and we're going to 
give you the values here, then we're going to go through and we're going to confirm it experimentally or verify experimentally. Delta H is relatively independent of temperature. The, the entropy is relatively independent of temperature as well. Um, if one of them are going to fail, it'll be entropy, and we'll see that in just a little bit. But the Gibbs free energy, or the free energy, is very dependent on temperature because we have it explicitly in the calculation of Gibbs free energy. So from a theoretical perspective, how can we explain this? Um, in Chem 100, excuse me, you may have seen potential surfaces, or if you, even if you didn't, it's bond energy. So the reaction enthalpy is how much energy is needed to be put in to break a chemical bond. It, the energy of the bond is independent of temperature. So if uh, an a carbon-carbon bond is 414 kilojoules per mole, it's going to be that whether you're at minus 50 degrees Celsius or plus 200 degrees Celsius. It's going to take 414 kilojoules per mole to break it. That is what's visualized in the figure down below. The temperature does not affect the amount of energy required to break a chemical bond, nor the amount of energy being given off during chemical bond formation. So reaction enthalpy is very independent of temperature. Reaction entropy, on the other hand, uh, gets its independence through a slightly different means. We saw last day that entropy is temperature dependent, the absolute entropy. And so the figure down below is the entropy of water. And we saw that as a function of temperature, it goes up as it, the temperature increases. But the thing to realize is that entropy increases at approximately the same rate for reactants and products. So if I were to take the product's entropy minus the reactant entropy, I get a value that doesn't change that much. The entropy difference is relatively independent of temperature. So in the example that's presented here, it is the combustion of methane. And so when we go from 2000 to 2500 to 3000 Kelvin, the reaction entropy changes from 52 joules per Kelvin to 62. It changes, but that's over a thousand degrees, uh, and it changes by a bit. If there's going to be a breakdown, it will be because of the reaction entropy. And of course, the free energy, delta G as a function of T, is explicitly dependent on temperature. So in this equation that I presented, I've written delta H and delta S with no temperature dependence. There's no brackets T around them. That's fair. Because we just kind of showed that they're independent of temperature. But I've left the temperature dependence to emphasize that free energy is dependent on temperature. And since everything here depend, pertains to the system, we look up these values. They're all tabulated. I'm just cleaning up the equation a little bit to make it easier to understand and apply. So what we've got here is the theoretical explanation for why enthalpy and entropy are independent of temperature and Gibbs free energy is not. We can actually do this experimentally as well. And we're going to look at a number of phase transitions in order to verify this. And I'm just going to go over to the tablet for just a sec. There we go. A couple of, or last class or the class before, we had the equation S is equal to Q over T, or delta S is equal to Q over T. And what we also had was that constant pressure Um, there is something special about this equation. This is Carnot's theorem. At constant pressure, Q at constant pressure happens to be equal to delta H. So we ended up with the equation delta S is delta H over T at constant pressure, or under constant pressure conditions. OK. 
Okay. We're now going to use this equation to test the independence of enthalpy and entropy, or the temperature independence of en enthalpy and entropy. We're going to do this by looking at phase transitions. Um, so in terms of a phase transition where we're, you, we're going to use tabulated data at 298 Kelvin and we're going to try to calculate when that phase transition or at what temperature that phase transition occurs. I also want to go over to the document camera one more time to just to show you where I can also get this equation. Remember we have the equation delta G, function of temperature, is delta H minus T delta S. When we are at equilibrium, delta G is equal to zero. So that leaves us with the expression delta H minus T delta S is equal to zero, or T is equal to delta H over delta S. This is just another way of getting the same equation. And since we are working with phase transitions, that would be melting and boiling. These are at equilibrium, our equilibrium systems. So those are equilibrium systems. So the end result is we're going to use 298 Kelvin data to estimate the melting and boiling points of different compounds and see how accurate or how close we can come to the experimental value. So through example, uh, the first one I'm going to look at is the freezing point of water. And then we're going to get you to do some of these examples. So in terms of data, the reaction that we're going to look at is water as a solid reacting to form water as a liquid. This is, of course, fusion process. And if you remember, we had ice tables where we tabulated data. We're going to do the exact same thing, and we're going to tabulate the enthalpies of formation and the entropy. So off of the data table, we can get the find that I'm just going to give you the values 291.8 and minus 285.8 with units of kilojoules per mole. And the entropy is 48.1 and 69.9 joules per mole Kelvin. And just as a refresher, um, if we want to calculate the change in enthalpy for the reaction, we would simply do products minus reactants. So would be minus 285.8 kilojoules per mole times one mole of water minus negative 291.8 kilojoules per mole times one mole of water. Remember, you always multiply by the stoichiometric coefficients to get the value. And so at the end of the calculation, you find that this is equal to 6.0 kilojoules. So delta H of fusion is 6.0 kilojoules. 
and delta S of fusion is 21.8 joules per Kelvin. That is the end result of these calculations. We now want to calculate the melting point is delta H of fusion over delta S of fusion. Notice the units. We have units of kilojoules and joules, so I'm on the fly going to convert. Just by multiplying by 1,000. And what we get when we do the calculations here is 275 Kelvin. Valid to two significant digits. But I'm carrying another digit through. And experimentally, we know that water melts at 273 Kelvin. So even though we're about 25 degrees off of 298 Kelvin data, we get something that is within the uncertainty of our data, the correct answer. Does anyone have any questions on that? I realize that I didn't prep you to have the data sheet available to you, um, but I do actually have the data sheet here. So available to you, of course, is the, just give me a second here. The chemistry data sheet that we have for the course, plus I also gave you that huge long list of th uh, tab tabulated data, thermodynamic data, and on there is, um, excuse me, on there is thermodynamic data. Thermodynamic data for the data sheet is on page, the back side of it, and entropies are tabulated at the top for some elements, um, just to save space, and thermodynamic data is presented here. We are somewhat limited in um, what data is available to you. I'm just going to, yeah, that's as best as we've got. I'm going to ask you as class, I'm going to go there, there's two reactions that we can do. One is the reaction of, go ahead Efren. Hi, sorry, uh, before you uh, go on to the next part, would you be able to scroll up to kind of the beginning and talk about your setup again? This? Oh, hold on a second, wait for it to uh, catch up. No, higher. Yeah, and the, what you did in the green, like how you were able to figure out your setup for that. Oh, the green? Okay. Yeah. So did you need information on the setup of this table or the calculation down below? I guess a little bit of both because I guess in a way they go connect. So I was having a hard time following sure. like how you were doing it. So, okay, I will do that. Then I will set everyone to, to for some tasks. Good, good question. All right. So all these are, um, in the case of the data here, these values come off of the, the data sheet. And I am literally just, normally what I would, remember when I said we had ice tables where we would have initial change in equilibrium? Well, I'm doing the exact same thing, except now I'm tabulating thermodynamic data rather than concentration. So uh, going over to this data sheet, Um, there is, I just need to find it, there it is, um, sorry, this, I need to get to the right tool too, so control L. My apologies, keyboard commands are somewhat slow, and one would look on here and one would find uh, the thermodynamic data for liquid and solid water. Solid water actually isn't on this data table, but uh, liquid water is. Minus um, 285.8 and 237.1 are the values that we have tabulated. 69.9, oops, whatever. Uh, I read the wrong value. Ah, I did read the wrong value. 
um, I'll explain it in just a bit. So the, the values are tabulated off of that data sheet. Uh, I just read the wrong column. And then below that, from Chem 100, you had the calculation of how you calculated reaction enthalpy, and that is calculated by taking products minus reactants. Products minus reactants multiplied by the stoichiometric coefficient. So we have 285.8 kilojoules per mole uh, for liquid water times one mole of liquid water. And then you do the same thing for the reactants. Does that make sense, Afrin, now? Yeah, it does. And then for your entropy number that you have, the 69 and the 48, you got that off the worksheet as well. Yeah, all that came off of that data table. Um, I will explain where my error is when I go back to it. What I want to do, uh, because I'm going to go back to it just in a few seconds. The reactions that I want to assign to you to do is that of H2O liquid reacting to form H2O gas. And of course, this is vaporization. The other one you can do is methanol, CH3OH liquid, going to form CH3OH gaseous. So you will be tabulating delta H of formation and entropies. Um, what I want you to do is not do both of them. Just because I just want to get some diversity, I'm going to say if your given name, your family name, is less than or A to M, A to M, do the first one and give me the boiling point for this. If you are N to Z, do that. Now we need to get to the data table. This is the data table we have. And my error was reading the wrong column, honestly. So enthalpy is the first column. Entropy is the final column. And so I can put it right here. And I should be able to put the methanol data. I don't have the ability to highlight in this state. The methanol data, CH3OH, liquid and gas, is right there. And water, liquid and gas, is towards the bottom. So if you would go through and do these and just type your values into the chat, that would be great. Uh, also, please realize that I can't actually go back to the chat because I'm sharing the screen that's visible. So if someone wants to come on and tell me numbers, that would be great too. Thank you. Anyone have a value? You should be able to kind of check your work anyway because you're actually given the boiling, well, you know the boiling point of water, 
but you're given the experimental boiling point of methanol. So um, if what I've been telling you for the past 15 minutes is correct, your number should be close. So that should give you some confidence in your values if you're close. Anyone have a number they want to share? I need to see what's here, 337.8, 336 for methanol. Okay, how about for water? 44 kilojoules, but that's not the boiling point. I needed the boiling point of water. The enthalpy of uh, vaporization is 44 kilojoules, yes. There we go. So we have numbers um, for water. The number that you should get is 370 Kelvin. Of course, the experimental value is 373 Kelvin. This is actually only valid to two significant digits as well, I think. Um, but there is only 1% uh, error here. That's not bad. For methanol, the experimental value, is, the, sorry, the calculated value that you should be getting is 336 Kelvin. And experimentally, it is 338. Yes. So this is also within the experimental error as well. So it's about a 1% error as well. Good. If you were to do the lead example, the melting point that you would calculate is three, 623 Kelvin. Experimentally, it is 601. The difference here is only a 3% error. So we're using 298 Kelvin data and what we have found is that we're able to calculate something that is actually double the temperature to within 3% error. You're, that infers that enthalpy and entropy are very independent of temperature. So if there is a deviation and we're seeing small deviations that is primarily due to a breakdown in the assumption that change in entropy is temperature independent. That's where you're going to see these deviations arising from. How do we calculate the Gibbs free energy? Well, remember we just calculated reaction enthalpy and reaction entropy using products minus reactants. It doesn't work for free energy. That is the worst way of calculating Gibbs free energy because we know it's temperature dependent. The better way to do that is to use delta H minus T delta S. We can't use 298 Kelvin data to calculate the Gibbs free energy because it's only valid at 298 Kelvin. However, we can calculate delta G as a function of temperature at any temperature uh, simply using this equation here, delta H minus T delta S. And then we can get it at any temperature we want. Um, given the time, uh, it's the, we're, we're running to the end of the time for class. Um, I will stay here and answer any questions you have. Um, but uh, other than that, I will see everybody uh, next Wednesday. Uh, or if you have any questions, send me an email. And we'll go from there. All right. Thank you very much for your time.